Hi, my name is Chris Basler. I'm a solutions architect at Google Cloud. As solution architects, we help customers implement their solutions and are also the bridge to the cloud environment and all the services. Um, many customers are dealing with event processing and time-based processing. And um, so we are, uh, in these cases, um, working with uh, time series databases like InfluxDB. And today I'd like to share you um, the use case of IoT event processing in the energy sector and an architecture that um, is quite complex because it addresses several sub-use cases, so to speak, in one architecture to give you an impression on what you can do with time series database as well as um, what um, the Google Cloud and the services can contribute to your architecture. So the agenda today is I talk a little bit about the energy sector first, second um, about use cases in the energy sector, what's specific about those. And the third phase, we're looking at a life cycle event of one event and what can all happen to it uh, throughout its life uh, to get an understanding of the complexity involved, uh, especially when interfacing with other systems. I give you a brief overview of the Google Cloud so that you see the benefit benefit of embedding a time series database into Google Cloud. Uh, we briefly go over the influx DB tick architecture that is the core of the uh, um, time series database system. And then um, we talk about a, a wider architecture with concrete Google services that show you how you could implement these use cases in a very specific uh, setting. Um, so the energy sector can roughly be uh, categorized into the production, distribution, and consumption of energy. So the three top bullet points here. And um, on the production side, we have energy production systems that need to be monitored and as well as any issues be detected, so any anomaly that might occur. And uh, energy has all its facets. It's, it's oil, the established uh, energy sector, gas, wind, hydro, solar, and others and each has its specific um, ways of producing the energy extraction um, like from the ground or from the sun and requires accordingly monitoring and anomaly detection because um, in the next step, this energy that has been um, harvested needs to be distributed. So there is a distribution uh, that follows um, the energy production and you have a physical distribution like in the oil and gas uh, sector where you have physical objects moving around like a pipeline or cars or trucks and then you have um, the electricity smart grid that where you don't have the physical objects moving but the energy is moving in terms of electricity and so the smart grid because it's a complex system highly interconnected uh, needs to uh, accomplish an equilibrium between the supply and the demand and so there needs to be a lot of uh, observation and forecasting in order to direct the energy flows properly. And so there's a lot of monitoring required over time uh, that allows you to do the proper um, monitoring and forecasting. And so, for example, there are now more and more devices being added to the electricity grid, to the smart grid, called synchrophasers, for example, that emit events that allow you to monitor the smart grid and react accordingly. So there's a lot of input coming from the smart grid into, for example, time series databases from these different devices that are distributed um, across the grid. And then, of course, you have the consumption side. <clears throat> you have fleets, fleets of cars, trucks, planes, whatnot. And these uh, consume uh, energy based on their utilization, based on their um, goals. Uh, that has to be monitored and then consumption forecast and, and planned for. You have the commercial manufacturing sites, office buildings, you have the public infrastructure, um, the government, the local states, the military, and then of course you have private households. So from the production to distribution to consumption, there's many uh, phases involved, there's many technologies involved, there's many um, aspects to monitor, and time series databases are one mechanism to put it all into a perspective. So when we look at the analysis of these use cases, we see the uh, rough um, categorization into event collection. So from production system, consumption systems, and so on. So you, you see that a um, certain uh, production took place. So, so, so 
much energy was produced in this plant over there or from consumption perspective is that my fleet of cars or trucks has used so much energy today um, um, there's also an absence check so how do you know that all of a sudden uh, consumption is stopping or the production is stopping so you need to also um, have like a baseline you need to compare it with existing data on the monitoring side you want to monitor for trends for anomalies for outages um, what was there actually an outage or, um, of the production or was there just an outage of the monitoring system? So there's uh, problems like that to solve. You have forecasting predictions um, that are a combination of the current events, historic events, and then you have um, data like weather forecasting models that are not events per se, but they are playing a role into the forecasting. So if a huge storm is coming that has massive impact in the um, transportation infrastructure, then of course the forecasting has to change uh, in order to accommodate for that. Um, and the, after collecting a lot of events, you might want to do an offline uh, analysis, maybe long-term, like what happened in the last year or what worked and didn't work in the last year, which goes way beyond the current focus in order to get keep the system running and then you can have long-term uh, archiving there you archive everything from the time you started uh, so you can do uh, long-term trends and sometimes you have like regulatory environments in your particular business or environment that requires you to store all of that so the use cases go across the board and so one system um, that can cover all of these would be of course ideal so let's look at an event uh, through the life cycle of it and, um, and and this architecture here is an architecture that um, addresses all the use cases and all the aspects that we just discussed um, to a large extent um, in your particular use case of course there might be additional architecture elements that are necessary or maybe changes to the architecture to accommodate your specific need so the symbols on the left side here in the diagram represent the different types of inputs you might have so you know you might have uh, inputs from observing uh, sensors you might have inputs from people entering data you might have inputs from observing uh, behavior like cars and trucks and people whatnot so all of these produce events basically saying um, at this point in time i saw that at this point in time i saw this flow as at this point in time I saw this rate of consumption at this point in time. I saw that um, a road was blocked and all my engines are idling. Whatever the events are that you're collecting, all of those need to be ingested. So, so the red uh, event symbol here on the left says there was an event in one of these devices and it goes to an ingestion component that simply collects those events. So there needs to be a communication mechanism from the different devices into an interface that is able to recognize that an event is coming. It needs to understand the type of event that's coming and it needs to be able to read and receive these events fast enough because some of these sensors produce a high rate of um, events. So this ingestion device needs to be able to scale and be available all the time in order to not lose events because of infrastructure issues. So once the event is ingested, then it's available in software, so to speak. It's available in the IoT architecture. And um, the next step usually is to take this event and put it into a time series database. Now, when that step happens, fundamentally you take isolated individual events that have no relationship to each other necessarily based on if I just look at the single event and I put them into a database. And in this database now, all the events are coming together in the sense that they all now have a similar structure. All of them have a timestamp, all of them have an identifier, and all of them have a detail. Now events uh, need to have more structure, of course, especially in this energy sector, because I need to know, is this like a consumption event? Is this a production event? Uh, where does this event come from? Which specific sensor it's coming from? because if I have like hundreds of thousands of sensors, it's important to understand the distribution of events across these sensors. So the time series database, because it stores these events and makes them accessible, now allows these events to be um, accessible for querying, accessible for monitoring, and they're all together in one structure, meaning 
They're co-located from an analysis and query viewpoint. So if you have these events in a time series database, and of course they're continuously added, uh, so every second more events are coming in, uh, then you can use real-time analytics to simply observe what's going on. So you can simply observe, do I have from this particular um, device or this area, this, this geographic area of the grid, do I have a regular stream of events coming in? Are they trending somehow? Do they show me constant data or all are these events are stopping? So uh, with a real-time anal analytics, I can look at all the events or subset of the events and I can see their change in the value of the metrics they represent in order to derive um, insight from it. Um, so this I can do, but real-time analytics really has to do with a lot of events at the same time. And um, long-term trends might be really hard to do because the real-time analytics is really to look at real time. So you're interested in usually what's happening right now, what happened in the last minute or hour or day. Uh, real-time analytics is usually not used for looking at uh, long-term trends or combination with other data. This is where you go into the offline analytics. So here, I have the same event again in a offline analytics system, like for example, BigQuery in Google. And if I have an analytics system, now I have the ability to combine the event as a piece of data with other data that I have already, like static data sources or dynamic data sources. So static data sources, for example, would be a geographic map that is of the US, for example, that shows me all the locations of all the sensors that I'm monitoring. So I don't have to have this information with every single event coming in, but I could combine the static data source with the event to show which events are coming from what area. And for example, if I combine the events with the uh, map, in this case, I probably can create a heat map that says which areas have a lot of activities and which areas do not have any activity at all that might, that should have an activity. Um, then I have dynamic data sources. For example, each sensor needs to be uh, identified. It needs to have a location. And for example, sometimes sensors are taken offline for maintenance. So it might be that a particular sensor will be offline uh, in the afternoon for one hour. So my event or my sensor management system would tell me that, would tell me that particular sensor over there is out for one hour this afternoon. And so if I don't have events coming in for that sensor during that hour, then this is actually normal. This is not a, like an exception. So I could use uh, the dynamic data sources in order to interpret the event data to see, ah, even though there's an outage, it doesn't matter because uh, it's supposed to be out. Um, so offline analytics gives me the ability to combine these data sources and analyze the set of all the data sources. So this is why in the offline analytics, you see the event symbol as well as the symbol that represents these different data sources. And it can be any number of these data sources. And in, in a real complex environment, there could be quite a number of these external static or dynamic data sources that have to be combined in order to accomplish offline analytics. Now, some uh, uh, events are coming from the sensors, but there might be other events coming from other environments so this is represented here by the blue event symbol saying is there might be application systems out there that collect events somewhere else through a different mechanism and they might have to be combined or do you want to combine them with the events you are monitoring through the system that you're looking at. So you might have additional events or maybe you are not owning your fleet, maybe you are uh, leasing your fleet and the owner of the fleet of trucks has already a monitoring system in place. So it might not make sense for you to add monitoring for these trucks a second time, but you interfacing with the existing monitoring system of the owner of the trucks that you lease your trucks from. So you combine your events with the events that the owner of the truck fleet uh, already has. And these might be coming into application systems. So you import existing events from another system into your own time series database for combination. So um, not all the events that you need, you, you're collecting yourself. There might be event sources that you might uh, want to import. The same is for weather data, for example. If, you, if your application, your use case is very weather dependent, 
you might import events from a weather monitoring system uh, on the ground that's already in place and combine it with events that are uh, relevant to your business. And then finally, at some point in time, events uh, are not important anymore to look at right now or, or put analysis on because uh, the event has been looked at and has been processed, but you want to keep it around. So you can put it into long or short term archiving to make sure that you can access the event if you need to, but you remove it from your uh, current systems because A, you don't need it anymore, B, it re uh, reduces the resource consumption, you don't have to store it, so you don't need to have storage space, especially if you have a high rate of events coming in. And if you have um, a lot of different event types, then you might have quite a large data set. So anything you can remove and archive benefits your application and use case. Um, so one of the systems that produces a lot of events is, for example, the Collider in CERN in, in Europe. And, and like one experiment they run for a few seconds has like petabytes of events. And so this is like an extreme case, but it makes the point that um, maintaining the events forever in the real-time database, time series database might not be um, the best strategy when it comes to resource management. So let's switch gear a little bit and let's look at Google Cloud. Um, so Google Cloud um, is a global system, operates uh, in many places on, on the planet. And um, here you can see um, the different regions the Google Cloud is uh, represented in. So each blue dot is in the region, this is up and running and services are available in these regions. So each, each blue dot is a single region and a single region is, uh, consists of three or more data centers, which are called zones. And each zones is this data warehouse size um, physical building with all this computing infrastructure and networking infrastructure inside of it that uh, allows all these services to uh, run and execute. So each dot here is like at least three data centers and each data center is a massive amount of computing infrastructure. And the non-filled dots here, the ones with the blue rim, blue border and, and the white filling, these are the future regions that have three zones three data centers. And so you can see as while there's a lot of um, regions around, there are plans to um, increase that. And, and the ones that you see here on the map are the ones that are being uh, actively uh, planned. Now, all these regions are connected by a network. And so here you see the different uh, networks, uh, network connections between these regions. And um, so there's a lot of connectivity, which means that you can really um, have traffic from one region to another. So if you invoke a service, then you can go from one to another and, and do this easily. The, the most important point here is that this is a private network. This is not the internet. So Google has its own global private network. So if your services reside inside the Google network, in the, inside the Google Cloud, and you have another service in the Google Cloud and one of your services invokes another one, all this communication is within the private uh, Google network and you're not competing with any internet traffic, you're not competing uh, with any outside um, uh, influence on that network. And our network is in our control, we can do the capacity planning, we can make sure that the network has low latency and all these aspects because it's in, full, in, in our full control. So in that sense, this is the important piece here is that once you are in the Google Cloud, you are on a private network. And this has a lot of benefits uh, that you can uh, look at um, and that are spelled out. So here are some of the Google Cloud services. I don't want to go and explain every single one here and, and go into detail, but it's just giving you an impression that there's quite a number of services around. So chances are if you need certain functionality, there might be a service already that uh, provides you with a large extent of the functionality you need. And to give you an impression of how this looks like when you look at all services at the same time, then there's this graphics here uh, that by intention you can't read, but it just shows you the different areas and, and the amount of services that are available. So before you engage in any uh, development activity on your own, it might be a good strategy to look into what services are available, which ones can you use, and combined with our global footprint in all these regions and the private network, it might make a lot of sense to use existing technology instead of building everything up from scratch yourself. So some of the services um, are the following ones and, and these ones I'm going to use later on in this bit more uh, detailed architecture that points out specific services. 
because that might be relevant uh, already to you. So one is BigQuery. BigQuery is our analytics database. It's a relational database. So you're creating uh, tables and you can access that by using the SQL language that you are familiar with, or most likely are. And um, it's a columnar uh, store. It can scale to petabytes of data and it's available in multiple regions, of course. So any analytics you have to do, any large scale and analytics, any analytics that will grow over time and with many events, the growth rate can be significant. BigQuery is the system that allows you to deal with whatever scale requirements are coming your way. Uh, another system, which is like an operational database is Cloud Spanner. It's a relational database. It uh, allows you to implement a relational model. Um, the important part here is that it is a consistent relational database, it's asset consistent. So it's not eventually consistent, it's asset consistent. And it can scale linearly. So you can keep adding uh, capacity to it forever, so to speak. There is no upper limit to capacity. The unit of capacity is a node, and a node is like a two terabyte of size, and you can keep adding nodes. So we have customers that have tens or hundreds of thousands of these nodes, and they can build up the capacity in this database uh, in quotes forever. Now this means that if you have an application where you cannot predict or foresee uh, the upper limit of any data growth, Spanner supports you because Spanner doesn't impose a limit in the size it can handle. Um, cold line storage on the other side is a storage that is really designed and made for long-term storage. So the assumption is if you store something in cold line storage, you're not going to access this every day or every, every week or every month. So this is storage that is specifically designed for you to store data securely, reliably, but you're not going to access this for a long time. So this, for example, if you have large data sets that you need to keep, but you're not going to access, you can put it in cold line storage and the price per bit is uh, a lot lower than of course, the keeping the same data item around in a database like Spanner or an analytic system like BigQuery. And finally, on the functionality side, um, one service here is machine learning. So machine learning, we have a platform called AI platform, and that allows you to um, implement machine learning uh, algorithms on a higher level. So you don't have to implement everything from scratch. You can use uh, interfaces to upload data, to have the model learn, and then to use the model that you taught the system to understand. So here you have, if you have to do uh, predictions and you want to do predictions based on machine models, machine learning models, uh, the machine learning engine uh, would give you a starting point uh, to base your functionality on. So um, now this was Google and the services available. Here is the architecture of the InfluxDB, the time series database. So you have the database here sitting in the center. Um, so that's the database, the core of the database. And then you have different systems around it uh, that implement an interface to the database. So the chronograph, for example, gives you the query capabilities to query your database. So if you are interested in a certain aspect and you want to determine it right now by means of a query, then you can issue the query and get a result back. Uh, then you have um, Telegraph, which is uh, a system that allows you to uh, collect metrics and events. So this is like a, a system that gives you the ability to connect to the database. And then you have Capacitor that allows you to connect to other functionality that's available. So here you see, for example, user-defined functions, machine learning, and so on. So InfluxDB uh, really um, implements the ability to store all your events, to query it, but then also to interface with other systems, like for example, services of the Google Cloud. And that gives its ability to be embedded into a large architecture. And that's really important because it removes a lot of requirements and needs to implement your own functionality because you are able to connect it with existing services. So let's go through an architecture, starting with the same sensors on the left that we had before. But this time, we go through detailed services and how these services would interact. And that's the, in the remainder of the presentation. Uh, this gives you an idea of how a event architecture could be based on InfluxDB and the Google ecosystem um, that we just talked about. So Google Cloud has a service called Cloud RIT Core. 
and that service is the one that can receive all these events from all these different devices based on the standard protocols in this space, standardized protocols in this space. So Cloud IoT Core is the receiving um, component of the architecture that allows you to register and to um, monitor and insert ingest all these events that you are interested in. It's a dynamic system, so you can add and remove um, sensors over time uh, and, and based on the Google Cloud architecture, based on the regions, it's a high scalability system that allows a massive amount of ingest at the same time. Now, tick, running on Google Cloud. So the symbol here is the computer engine symbol, has an interface to Cloud IoT. So when you use the uh, InfluxDB uh, tick architecture, the whole stack, then you have um, Cloud IoT core already integrated with it or interfacing with it so that any event coming in through Cloud IoT core shows up in the database and the events are stored in the database and available to you for access. So the symbol on the bottom representing a mobile device uh, allows you to look at and query the database right away after the events have to be integrated. And in order to set this up, you have predefined components, predefined interfaces that allow you to do that. The effort to implement this is very low because of the pre-integrated nature uh, of these systems. So let's first look about the offline analytics that we talked about before. So the offline analytics uh, is centered around uh, the ability to take the events from the database which is on the left side, the tick stack. And the events can be extracted into Cloud PubSub. Again, this interface is defined. And through data flow, uh, these events can be integrated and loaded into BigQuery. So in addition to loading, there's also a merge operation to ensure that you can continuously ingest the events into BigQuery. So you do not have to have like one load cycle every 24 hours. You can do this in real time. Um, on the other side, BigQuery can access, for example, a Cloud SQL database. It's part of its processing to acquire more data, to combine data sets. Or, for example, Cloud Dataflow can be used to insert data into BigQuery in order to combine data sets. So if you have the static or the dynamic um, application data sets that we talked about earlier, these can be integrated into BigQuery by means of direct access to the databases or by data flow. And now the end user can access all the events coming from the uh, time series database and from these different systems and do the analysis required. Analysis is expressed in terms of queries, SQL queries, and, and um, those can be executed and looked at. The results can be looked at from any device that can interface with BigQuery. Um, we talked about um, events might come in through existing applications like the fleet manager, fleet owner that owns the fleet of your trucks that already uh, collects events. So for example, here it could be that this system out there that manages the trucks is for example, a system on Kubernetes stores its data in Spanner and you wanna have these events coming from the truck or fleet owner into the um, uh, time series database then you could, for example, use Dataflow to extract it from Cloud Spanner and can use PubSub to get it to the database, uh, time series database, as well as taking those events and feeding it back into this particular existing system. So here you can see that these, are, these connections are bi-directional, meaning that data can go from the time series database into these external systems, or data from the external systems can go into time series database. So this allows you to combine real-time information in order to have it all available in the same time series database, even though these are not the events that you collected, these are events somebody else collected. Then we have the machine learning uh, integration. So here again, we use the events, extract them, uh, and use, for example, Cloud Run, which is another service that uh, provides you the ability to implement uh, computing logic and store the events that are then used as input to the AI platform. So this is a mechanism then to do your model analysis, and model predictions after you imported all these events into the platform. And this is a way um, to do it. And finally, um, uh, here we have the, oops, here, here we have um, finally the uh, mechanism to um, archive events. 
um, a scheduler on a regular basis, for example, you know, once an hour, once a day, once a week, depending on your use case, um, invokes a Cloud Run function, which implements logic, which is extracts the event from the database and then stores it into, for example, cloud storage for long time archiving. So all of this can happen at the same time. All of this can work at the same time in different parts, uh, in different regions, different parts of the world, depending on your use case. And of course, there's only one example. This is like one way to address many of the use cases we talked about. And in your specific use case, you might have different architectures, different combinations of existing services in order to implement um, the use cases you need to have implemented. So in summary, um, from this abstract architecture here, where we talked about how an event can be ingested and then stored, analyzed, and stored, we looked at a particular implementation in context of the Google Cloud, uh, supporting you in all the use cases you have using the services that the cloud provides, based on the InfluxDB time series database with its ability to connect to um, the outside world through the different interfaces um, it has. Thank you very much for uh, listening and I hope you can see you on the Google Cloud pretty soon. Thank you very much.